This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to bigheadsmedia.com for more great podcasts. In this episode of Bicurian, Eric and Aisla discuss the forthcoming 2020 election. And Eric comes out on the side of ethics. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And together we are the hosts of the Bicurian Podcast. Bicurian is our answer to the polarizing culture we live in. Tired of feeling under siege and looking for ways to get involved? Then come be a part of a different way of thinking. Everything from politics to geek culture to current events that polarize us as a society. We explore multiple ways of looking at things. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I guess my only question at this point is, how tired is everyone of everything going on? Oh, I'm pretty tired. (laughs) So this is the last show we're going to have pretty much before the election. And Eric very cleverly uh, came up with the idea of calling it Decision 2020. Which is what CNN's going to be calling it. And I just feel like that's where we're going to be living for the next little while. Hold on. Don't don't give this to CNN. You're <laughs> the one that said it. I heard you. <laughs> just because you don't know where I took it from. Well, hey, like, what's plagiarism but, like, the highest form of flattery, right? Yes. So I could have called it indecision 2020, except that's something probably the Daily Show is calling it at this point because they called all of the previous elections indecision 2016 and all of that. That's fair. But like, is it like in um, the Three Amigos where we're in the decision and that's why it's so intense? Like indecision 2020, like being in famous, like it's more than being famous because you're in famous. No. Not so much. You I think it's really about the fact. Well, and so here's my initial question. Sure. To start things off. Okay. I also, well, I have another thing too, but we'll do your initial question and then we'll circle back. Well, I'm just curious how many people probably haven't made up their mind yet. Oh, I think there's like four people that don't know how they're voting. Especially, I, I had the speculation. Or if they're voting. Yeah, well, I had the speculation that with all of the fears around voting, I think anyone who was being indecisive probably come mid-September First, October 1st, probably had an idea how they were going to vote since they had to put more effort into deciding what they needed to do to vote as opposed to deciding who they were going to vote for at that time. I I will tell you, I personally feel like, one, we need to have some kind of legislation or agreement that election season, campaigning, whatever you want to call it, torture, <laughs> needs to be no more than a year long. Oh, like yeah. this, I... And I feel like one no of those old ads. people. Yeah, I get it. I'm like, well, back in my day, blah blah. This was not the world we lived in. It, it no. doesn't end, and it's no. ridiculous. People need to do other things with their time. No, well, especially, and I, I just think this year in particular, we're all a little fatigued from a little thing called COVID, and probably all the other stuff that's been happening. And our state is on fire. Colorado's on fire. We made the national news on that. We were the. F- Third story down of the top five national news articles mm. on my news conglomerator. Your news conglomerator. <laughs> yeah, no, we were seriously in top three. So, and it's. I mean, I'm I'm saying this in a way that sounds like I'm taking light of it, and and to a certain extent, that's how I'm talking about it. And it's horrifying and terrifying. People are like losing their homes, and uh, a close friend of mine is unlikely to be evacuated. However, if they are evacuated, plans A through C are not viable because they're either also on fire or currently have too many people. Yeah. Like it's, it's not, when I say our state is on fire, it's not a huge exaggeration. Yeah. You had a thing you wanted to start with though. I I launched right in. But you know, I love that about you. Like you dive in, you lay, you're, you're right here, present, making things happen. So in addition to getting us started today and making our sound awesome, uh, one of the things we had talked about, because we have really wanted to make our podcast an opportunity for people to take on some different uh, options and exploration, was to talk about some critical thinking tactics or concepts or skills as part of our shows when it's just the two of us. And uh, I thought for today, what I could do, if I can get my computer awake, is to just talk about what is the definition of critical thinking and why do we care about it? And so the the definition that I found on criticalthinking.org. So I'm going to call them a, a really like 
legit it's fake source, news. right? Fake news. It might be, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> Here's what, you can use your critical thinking skills to evaluate it. How's that sound? <laughs> Deal. Um, so their definition is critical thinking is the art of analyzing and evaluating thinking with a view to improving it. I would insert your personal thinking. It's usually something that you apply to your own experience. It's not typically something I mean, I, I wouldn't personally walk up to someone and be like, hey, you're not critically thinking about that. I mean, if I wanted to start a fight, I would more often use it to value my own pr uh, perspective and how I am approaching a topic, whether it's from a reflex or from a more balanced and thoughtful view. Fine. And let me just say this. I love that analytical an or analysis was in the definition because that to me is what critical thinking is truly analyzing things. Um, my brain's a little more suited to this than some people, so I get that this might not necessarily be an easy thing for some people, but you've got to take your emotions out of it. You know, I think the only way you can see both sides is to not be emotional about it, and you have to have an almost analytical view. So I like that definition. Yeah, I, I thought it was a good... I, I've actually been looking, you know, for a while, because we we talked about it as something that we think is important and that we want to promote and engage in ourselves. And I haven't been satisfied with a lot of the definitions and perspectives that I've found. To be frank, they were a little condescending. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I did appreciate this one, just laying it out in this very direct, clear way. And uh, I'll, I'll give a little plug for criticalthinking.org. That's not super hard to remember. And what they have, um, and what I'm pulling from, for this uh, resource is the miniature guide to critical thinking. It's like 11 bucks and it has the definition and the result, like why we care about it and a variety of tools and perspectives. So that's let's, my, let's that's, put a link to it. Oh, well, obviously, but I'm just putting it in the show too. So I, I haven't read it, but I think I can recommend that our listeners are probably smart enough to read it and think critically about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm talking to you, America. <laughs> So at any rate, that was that's our um, that's all I have. And that's the show for this folks. moment. Thanks. Oh, or yeah, that could be the show. Like, would it be our fastest show ever? Or do you so, want to talk about indecision decision? So let's talk. Let's let's critically think about some things. Okay, sure. What um, do you want to start with? Well, obviously, this is a pretty important election. Yes, I, I really do feel like whatever future we want to have is going to be defined by this. And I think it's safe to say that there are some things that the current administration has done that the Democratic Party will never fully undo, probably not in our lifetimes. We're not old and we're not young. But I do have some fears that, you know, some of the damage that could have been done in the last four years as far as judge appointments, just that alone, is is going to be significant. And in a lot of ways, I think that a lot of Republicans are probably pretty satisfied with what they got out of this thing. Because to be honest, there's been a lot of Republicans coming out against Trump lately. A lot of people. Uh, and there was a one of the senators or, or House members in Texas, and I just caught a glimpse of it. But I, I filed it quickly under, yep, that makes sense, that he basically said that he hasn't agreed with anything Trump said, and he's tried to get Trump to say the right things, and it's like a spouse that you can't just get them to say what you mean. I was like, wow, that's loaded. There, there's I'm a sure, lot to unpack there with yeah, your critical thinking I'm, skills. I'm <laughs> sure we can probably find a link to that because Texas and somebody speaking out against Trump, but I think that really summarizes it, is that in the end, look, I'm not a fan of Trump. We've danced around that subject since we started the podcast and really have tried hard not to necessarily come straight out and say, you know, screw Trump, I'm over it. And let me be the first one to say it two weeks before the election, screw Trump, I'm over it. <laughs> I'm done. I want out of this. You've revealed yourself. I have. But here's the thing. I don't even, you know, I'll be the first to say that there might be uh, not completely insane Republicans that I would get along with. I think they're out there. They, they they poke their heads up a little bit once in a while. Well, the the concepts of conservatism, which is not the same as what the Republican Party currently is or supports or Trump as president, 
there are some aspects of that that we've both talked about being very in alignment with. Like I'm, I'm, I have some traditional views and you know, we're both in different ways comfortable with gun rights and gun ownership. Um, yeah. And so it, not that that's the, the deciding factor, but it's often the one that gets poked at the most. And, and so for what me. I'm, what I am not for is racism. I'm not for winking a nod to white supremacist groups. Like we're going to be disassembling that for the next several years. And when I say disassembling that, I mean FBI raids on people that think they're going to overthrow the Michigan government. That's a normal sort of thing because what Trump did is empower these people with his wink and a nod stuff. You know, stand back and stand by. Well, they are. And they're already in a state where the minute we have Democrats in power, they're going to decide that military force is what's necessary. So now we are in an interesting world because we're going to be unpacking basically domestic terrorism for a while. Well, and, and I don't even know that Trump fully buys into that. But here's the thing. Well, he doesn't care anything that gets him attention. Yeah. Like, he's he likes obviously the attention. That. He thinks that there's some form of his base. They are not a majority, even though. They look like there's a lot of them when you see a rally in front of the Michigan Capitol or whatever. Well, I'm just going to do a spoiler alert here with the, the boys, because that moment with Stormfront, when she's talking to Homelander, so spoiler alert, uh, when she says, you don't need 50 million people to love you. Nobody can get the whole country. You need 5 million people to be angry. And and that was just a moment for me of really understanding like the the politics of fear and hatred that have been highly promoted and honestly by most of the major parties, in my opinion. However, Trump has wielded it with less shame and more manipulation than I have seen in modern uh, politics. And I haven't seen everything, so feel free to correct me on what else exists. Is It's horrifying. It's horrifying how easily we as a country react and are manipulated by our emotions in this way. And the, the ways in which people do feel so disenfranchised are ready to jump on anything. And that's the problem. As a slightly left-leaning, fairly progressive type of a person, I felt disenfranchised for the last four years, but in a significant way. Because to be honest, I'll take George Bush any day right now. I get it. It wasn't great. And it, it was not a daily mess that the Trump administration's been. And that's one of the reasons I can't abide where we're at right now i mean flagrant lies you know i I, i'm i'm utterly shocked the news of the day as of this recording this is going to be released you know a couple of days after we record it we're recording on tuesday by the way exactly two days out or or two weeks out from the election so and this come the show will come out on thursday but as of today i'm seeing more hunter biden stuff and more Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and all of this stuff they did. I mean, it is a drop in the bucket to a regular Wednesday for Trump. Mm -hmm. And he's never been held accountable. And I am all for it. But I need the Republicans and their claims of ethics to actually hold up. Just like pushing through Amy Barrett is a joke when they wouldn't actually even entertain the idea because the election was coming up last time this happened. And they're all two-faced liars and all i want i don't even care what your political beliefs are i will have a lot more respect for you if and only if you actually say and do the things you mean we're not even talking about a different regime here we're talking about mitch mcconnell saying i will not do this mark my words i can play the recording mitch mcconnell saying mark my words i would not push through a judge right before an election and if i do it you can tell me how wrong i was and they did and he said i don't care I am done with this lack of ethics. Yeah, lack of integrity, lack of consistency. And my concern is also this the cozying up to, you know, authoritarian dictators across the world. Like, uh, we are more aligned right now with North Korea than we are with well, that's any that's of the, the European countries. I, and that's one of the things that, for me, has been, it, I'm a little bit cynical. I try to hide it through my optimism. And the reality is that I just don't expect our leaders to be anything other than corrupted and deceitful and primarily focused on power and money. So when they behave that way, it's not super surprising to me. 
the fact that that Trump is so comfortable promoting his affinity for Vladimir Putin and for North Korea, it's to me that's problematic at best and horrifying at worst. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean it, it's it's a really it's a it's a difficult scenario that we're in. You're right, the Biden stuff coming up. It, the reality is, I'm sure there's corruption there. I I'm really as you know, like we've talked about things like the ranked choice voting, because I'm very committed to like whatever happens with this election, my focus continues to be an interest in creating opportunities for people to challenge this, the chokehold that the party system has on our government and on our society, this partisanship. I mean, the the real situation that we're in right now is we have two people running for president and their their primary like call to action is I'm not the other guy. Yep. Like that's really and truly like what the I'm not the other guy. The other guy is super bad. He's gonna be super scary. Well, I think we we can we did so on our last episode, but we'll out ourselves again. We're a fan of ranked choice voting. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that I probably wouldn't vote re- Republican or Democrat if I felt like I had a choice. If I felt mm-hmm. like the actual health and safety of my close to, close loved ones was not at risk, if the wrong guy gets elected right now, um. If I felt like we weren't going to be at war or living in some sort of like weird propaganda run state news agency place, because that is exactly what Trump would love to do. I can't vote my heart right now. I need to vote the safe choice to save the people I care about in myself. Mm-hmm. Well, and and that's my situation in that, like, one of the things that has really become clear to me over the past few years is that. While folks, and I will say in the two majority parties, uh, consistently talk about freedom, they talk about it in really different ways. And and my assertion is, if you only care about your freedom or the freedom of people who look like you or think like you, you actually don't care about freedom. You care about entitlement. You want things your way. And that that as like association with liberty when it's actually entitlement and a complete lack of interest in personal responsibility for me has really made a a, a strong disillusionment with the whole situation. Like I I think if you're for gun rights, you should also be for uh, the freedom to choose when it comes to bearing a child and the legalization or the decriminalization of drugs and sex workers. I mean, to me, freedom is freedom. Stop pretending that you care about liberty when what you care about is your agenda. Yeah. And I and I feel like both of the major parties really kind of use the same clarion call to amp us up against each other. And then when you listen, like you had me, I, I appreciate you most of the time for this because you're like, let's watch Fox News because we're kind of a little bit left leaning. So we should broaden our horizons. And I appreciate your commitment to that kind of balance. However, it was so intriguing to me. And I was listening to a comment commentator on Fox News a few months ago talking about gun rights. And I was like, wow, I could very easily remove gun rights or Second Amendment rights or the right to buy arms from his conversation yeah. and put in the right to choose or access to abortion. And pretty much all the rest of the text would be exactly the same. And that was just such an aha moment for me in terms of recognizing that the this concept, this value of freedom and liberty that we are taught to embrace as Americans has been subverted and perverted to equal entitlement and sort of an adolescent, it's my way, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's interesting because they have the talking heads on there. And as you pointed out, it was gun rights or it could have been one or various other things. And I think that's really where we're getting to. We need to, as responsible civic citizens, have our own sort of rank choice on what we feel are important issues. And we can have most important issues, but we actually need to start balancing it with the other issues. I mean, you and I have both had a ton of experience with LGBT. We could easily make that our calling card for everything. Every decision that gets made by a politician should be weighed against our LGBT views on what's actually benefiting the people that we feel the closest with, our tribe, if you will. Yeah. But the reality is that's a terrible reality to live in. It should because be. Yeah, it's not it, enough. It's it's not it's it's not that we can't have that be our primary 
thing. But if we elect somebody who's friendly to the gays, but is also like really bad on several other things, we're not doing ourselves any favors. And I think that's how we ended up with Trump. And I think that's how we've ended up in a lot of bad situations in recent years. Yeah. We need more we need more broad based politics. And that's why I make that point about liberty. Like if liberty is actually your calling card, then neither of the major parties is actually supporting access to true freedom in that like both it's, of it's them- not a progressive stance to say they're progressive on one thing. But if they're a climate change denier, why is that not an equal concern, which is why we base this show on so many different subjects? Because at the at the end of the day, the show is doing very little more than serving my personal views on getting things out there that I find important, and they're not one thing. Because people are not that way. Like, there's no person you're going to talk to, and this is the other thing. Like, I obviously we have friends from a variety of political ideologies, and the reality is that none of my liberal and progressive friends feel like we should just have randomly open borders and everybody just pour in. And none of my conservative friends are like, we should be, you know, putting kids in cages and separating them from their families and treating them inhumanely. The reality is most of us are fairly sensible. And we believe that a fair immigration policy, a fair and humane immigration policy and border security are equally valid and necessary aspects of our process. And the that's why I say like the political marketing is really the problem. They they right. they 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 put it, but they pit us against each other. They say these people are gonna like, you know, just open the borders willy nilly. It's no nobody's standing for that. If there are people standing for it, they really are in the minority. It's just not what's happening. But well, we get so amped up, we're not listening to each other. We're not thinking critically about it. And that's the thing. We are all responding to the attack ad world that we now live in. And it's where, easy to, right? Where, <laughs> you know, Trump's campaign releases something about how 911 calls will just be, like, ignored. Because that is literally what they're trying to scare people into thinking defunding the police would mean. Well, and let's be clear. It's, like, the worst marketing campaign ever. <laughs> like, it's not that we should be but, talking but about thing, it. Have you thought that maybe that affected a few people? Of course. Because there are folks who who feel very vulnerable and unprotected and honestly, we are taught to fear each other. And so, like, you're, you are uh, unique in this, that you, like, you know your neighbors and you talk to them. And I have often had relationships with my neighbors and gotten to know them. However, a lot of folks don't, like, really go outside of their house and get to know the people around them. And, and that's something we've lost, I think, for a number of reasons. And, and the result is that people do feel a little scared. They don't feel like they can go to their neighbor. I... I had a neighbor when my kids were younger who was uh, home. He was disabled. And one time uh, my sister-in-law's boyfriend came over to like, and he just came in the house and my neighbor had never seen him. And he like came over and was like, who are you? Cause he knew the kids had just gotten home from school. Like he yeah. was watching and people talk about nosy neighbors, but I felt so safe. Well, that's a reality. If you don't want nosy neighbors, buy some land. <laughs> right. I just felt so safe put, that he put cared, five, right? Put five acres around <laughs> you and your neighbors if you don't want that. But I mean, you know, even the concept. Let's unpack for a second the idea of the whole uh, ways in which suburban life is threatened by defunding the police. I mean, first of all, the racist connotations of urban life moving out of the inner city, i.e., urban, another code word for uh, minority. Yeah. Moving into your neighborhood and sudden and, and literally trying to fear monger around. If you like your neighborhood white, don't vote for the other guy. Trump's your man. Like, wow. Yeah, no, it and it's. It's unfortunate. Oh, you could trust your neighbors as long as they're the right color. Yeah, I. I hate that you're accurate sometimes, and I appreciate you for bringing these things up and noticing I mean, that. Trump had people on air, you know, during the, the Republican National Convention, basically saying they like the life they live in their neighborhood and they wouldn't want it destroyed. By what? Yeah. Black and brown people? Are you kidding me? No. Or are you joking me? They're not joking. And so, look. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it really strongly right now. 
no matter what happens, I am going to be on the side of protecting people's rights to be the human they are, whatever color they are, whatever religion they are, whatever their sexual preference, whatever their gender, all of that. I'm going to come down on the ethics of being in favor of people being able to be the person they are and at least have a fair shot if they move into your neighborhood, if they move into your workplace, if they move into your school, wherever, to have a shot at the same life you have. That's the bare minimum. We can talk about giving people the opportunity that they actually have been denied. Because right now we're fighting for the soul of this country to say that you can be brown and show up at a school or at a neighborhood or at a job and have a fair shake. Yeah. Whatever you had to overcome to get there. But I, I refuse to think of inner cities like Denver, San Francisco, New York, and all of that just being the place where we dump the undesirables so that we can keep our neighborhoods on the outside of all of that clean. Clean from what? Yeah. We are fighting for the soul of this country. Yeah. We, we have an opportunity to choose to live the values that we were founded on. We never have. And yet that doesn't make them values not worth striving for. And part of that is liberty and justice for all, not for not some, some not or white. the occasional or yeah, or the suburban or the wealthy. It's, it's supposed to be liberty and justice for all. And, and I agree with you. I think that we need to take some steps in that direction. And, and I don't think Trump is, that step right and i don't honestly think that biden is that step either however i think we get a lot worse without biden and like i said i'm not voting my heart right now yeah i honestly don't think candidates that i would have I, it's funny i filled out my ballot the other day so let me just announce i have voted i'm already done colorado's had mail-in ballots forever i got my ballot last week I'm waiting. I don't. I don't trust 2020 to like. You've been moving <laughs> be around. Predictable. <laughs> yeah, you've moved around a little bit. You might need to double check it. But no, no, I have my ballot. Oh. I'm just not going to send it in until like the day before. Oh, I figure the sooner it gets in, the better <laughs> like... of a chance it has of getting counted. And you know what? I'll just say that I don't know when our next show is going to be. We would probably try to record on election night. Maybe we will. Or... That would be really fun. But the reality is I think we might wait a day or two and, and maybe release the show a day or two late just to kind of see where we're at because I think we'll be in a heavy analysis place on all of that. It's neither here nor there, but the, it's going to be a mess. This is done over on November 3rd. But I voted, and there were 20 presidential candidates on that ballot. Including Phil Collins of the Prohibition Party. That wasn't very exciting to me. Not, not, not the real Phil Collins. Not the Phil Collins musician. But but I wanted it to be him. I'm, I'm actually impressed that there were so many people that were able to get on there. And to be honest, I didn't look at any of them. It's not like I would have voted on that. And ranked choice voting could solve that. Voting my heart. Maybe the right candidate for me was actually on that list. And I don't even know it because it's not a place I feel safe. And that is a problem. I am ignoring a lot of other people's opinions, their looks at how the society should run and, and their outlook on life and all of this because we're fighting for the soul of our country. Well, we're we fighting can't... for the least common denominator in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Like the, the country's too big for anyone truly innovative to capture enough of a majority for anyone to feel like safe, right? And so what we end up doing is having, you know, ultimately – you know, two septuagenarians <laughs> debating We've, on a stage. I'm yeah. like, I so feel represented. Yeah, they're going to be, as a friend of ours actually said this to you the other day, but I loved it. How about our, the future of our country right now not being decided by two people who will be dead within the next 20 years? Yeah. I, like it's it, their, their ability to like understand modern technology. I mean, did you listen to the Facebook hearings? In, in Congress, when they were like, people did not understand anything Zuckerberg was saying. Yeah. And so we have people in decision-making situations who are very out of touch with what's happening, with technology, with the prior, and they have assumptions about how things work that are just absolutely 100% no longer applicable. And I'm not saying that someone has to be young to understand these things. I'm simply acknowledging that a lot of the people in decision-making 
uh, positions right now clearly have demonstrated that they don't. They are, and maybe they do, and they're being willfully ignorant because it benefits them. However, their their public expression very much makes it clear they don't understand what we're dealing with in modern society. Yeah, and it's not, it's not, it's not just not progressive. It's not effective. No. Yeah, we're gonna have to sort it out. And we're going to have to sort that out. We're going to have to have younger people stepping up to vote because right now the reason why that's not happening. Look, I'm sure there are plenty of young people voting for Biden. To be honest, from what I have gathered from all of the polling data, the young millennials were all Bernie fans. If anything, they feel a little disenfranchised by not having Bernie as the candidate right now. Biden, an equally old white dude, is not their choice. And that's because he's not as progressive. But we're at least making progress. Guess where a lot of the progressive thoughts lie, folks? In people that might not be much older than the minimum required to run for president, which is 40, if you don't remember your history lessons. So you got to be a little older to at least even have a shot. But you know what? I'd love to see an interesting 50-year-old in there with some really hip ideas. And maybe we're getting there by the time we hit 2024. Yeah, I I, I think that... I think this generation, and I'm going to speak about the millennials, honestly. I think the millennial generation. I'm two years older than what's considered millennial. I'm in a weird spot right in between (laughs) Gen X and millennial. And so I totally get it. Well, and I think that the millennial generation, you do know my kids are also millennials. Like, that's weird. How how are you close to millennial? It doesn't make any sense. They're 15 years younger than me. I'm just kidding. I don't even know. I, I can't, I apologize for that digression, but we're not going to cut it out. Um, however, what I have seen, and it's part of how I've seen it, is that like, you know, the the youth are, they're invested and they're, they're disenfranchised. They watched the recession of 2002, 2008 really like hurt their families. You know, the, and I think that, you know, they're first, they're one of the few generations that have experienced attack on American soil. And I'm curious to see like when those and it's just not millennials, I don't think, but the Parker kids who like really stepped up to talk about like the issues with gun violence and and school shootings. And they were really clear, like we can't even vote, but we're being killed in our schools. Like are the adults in our country need to take action. And if they don't, we need to step up. And I th- I think there's a generation of kids that have really genuinely suffered. I mean, like their school experience is full of the idea they might get shot. I didn't have that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I, I think I f- we're going to see something in the next 10 years, but I think it's going to take 10 years for us to get there. And I think it's going to be rough, rough. Well, we're seeing we a sea change. And, and I'm, I'm happy about this because I think more young people are going to vote in this election than have. I think a lot of people phoned it in with Hillary four years ago. But they and, assumed she was going to win. And they're surprised. Yeah, because they just thought that the poll numbers were good. But I mean, I... I'm a gamer once in a while, especially during COVID and haven't left the house in any significant way (laughs) in months. And so video games have have been on my radar as a way to chill out and relax when I'm not working. And I was looking up something on one of my games on IGN, a gamer network. It's a big website and they have a big vote tag right on their header. Discord has it. Yep. Um, So the tech companies even- Instagram has it. (laughs) So uh, that to me is sea change because now the things that people do, regardless of age, but primarily, a, you know, a younger group, are getting lambasted by it. And right now, I will say that you are probably the kind of bad American that so many people want to accuse people of right now. But you know what? If you're not going to vote, you're probably the kind of bad American that you don't want to be. So go vote. Yeah. At the very least, no matter what happens, your voice will be counted. You can be a f- civic member of this society. Yeah, no, it's the minimum requirement. And I will say this, this whole situation has also really like challenged people to consider their views and their values. I was reading an article before the episode about, you know, Arizona is considered a battleground state. Cindy McCain endorsed Joe Biden. And there's a group uh, called the Mormons for Biden or something like that, or Biden-Harris. And I was reading an article, and they were saying, you know, ultimately, while they have concerns about, like, Biden's 
progressive views around, you know, sexual orientation and, and abortion, they can't stomach uh, Trump's libertine uh, ways and his inappropriate behavior. It doesn't fit with their values, which I will say for me as a former Mormon was a little heartening because I, I do feel that like in looking at the two candidates, I personally, were I still in that faith, would be very uncomfortable with Trump's behavior. And I understand, like you said, there's a lot of like arguments around judges and that kind of thing. However, it really comes down to like, do the ends justify the means? Is it is it a good idea to support someone that primarily counters many of the things that you stand for because you think they're going to do something in the long term you believe in? And so, I, I don't know, I was just really interested in that uh in that acknowledgement that, you know, getting out the vote right now, I think is going to be a very interesting mix to the table because I do feel like a lot of folks are making choices that they wouldn't have made four, six, eight years ago because they're genuinely being challenged to consider their values in a larger context, not just an automatic party response. I know there are also down ballot party voters, and it just seems like there's a lot more people who are really stepping up to, to be more thoughtful about the whole thing we have a long way to go before i feel like everybody can vote their heart yes right now it feels like we're voting in self-defense and that's where we're at and i would challenge everyone that's listening to actually think about the things that would be in their heart and think about what's blocking it stop picking the lesser evil fight for ranked choice voting but ultimately start actually looking at why we have ended up here because that is the critical thinking that I've been trying to do. I have the luxury of this platform. We can find all kinds of guests. We have a platform big enough they want to be on here. They want to talk to us. They want to use us to talk about what they're talking about. And we have intelligent conversations. We leave every interview. I'm going to toot our horn. We leave every interview with everybody we've ever talked to about how great They think what we're doing and how we talk about things, how we listen to what they're saying, how we see both sides. We were on a show that wasn't ours as guests this past weekend, and he was floored at how open we are. And I am a card-carrying liberal progressive, and I can have that conversation with anyone, and they'll see that. And you know what? If we all strive for that level of understanding and that level of of just trying to be involved. This doesn't take us hours and hours and hours. This is not our whole life. It's something we do because we care. And it's not that hard. So stop living in your echo chamber. Stop assuming what you read on social media is a fact. Actually look into it. I will say that one of the tactics I have taken to in the last few years is if someone shares an article or I find a a title that confirms my bias in any way, I immediately go to Snopes (laughs) and I look up to see if it's actually accurate. There's a lot of like uh, media fact checking. And I'd say about half the time, the thing that I've read is not accurate. It's either highly misleading or outright false. And I feel like that has been a really good practice to engage. It's helped me to really recognize the places where I was getting sucked in to this political marketing that ultimately doesn't serve me. It pits me against other people in my community that have the same struggles, maybe not exactly the same, but they're just trying to do the same things, like make a living, spend time with the people they care about, you know, fulfill themselves in some fashion. You know, I don't, I don't need to be against them because they're doing it in a slightly different way than I am, but it's really easy to buy into it when people like throw stuff at you that is either misleading or false that tells you all the things about them that are just horrible. Yeah. That's what we mean by critical thinking. Just dig a little deeper. Yeah. It'd be, and it's okay to be wrong. And, you know, we all are sometimes, you know, I'll leap to conclusions and then I, you know, learning how to like, crow and apologize like I don't like it but I raised teenagers so I got used to it and I'm just going to say I don't think things are going to be better in two weeks I don't think they're going to be better in two months there's a lot of stuff going on and as we're recording this my little cat just brought me his little toy and he likes to play fetch he's like a dog and 
I have this little rattly mouse. And I'm going to throw it for my cat. And you know why? Because sometimes you just need to take a step back and relax. And play fetch with your dog or your cat. It's really, really important right now. I just want to actually say, because this really brought this up for me, you know, some self-care right now. We don't need to be completely lost in all of this yeah. all the time. Yeah, It's a lot. And we're not thinking rationally when we're just inundated every day. So take five minutes and have a cup of tea or go for a walk or try to find something that's joyful and try to offset some of the madness because, yeah, I'm, I'm genuine. I'm concerned for my own health and sanity that things are not going to improve right away. Yeah. When I, I published an article in our Medium channel a couple weeks ago called A Little Political Hope. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. I'll link to it in the show. And one of the things that I really wanted to highlight is that, yes, this election feels like a big deal. And and a lot of people are going to be impacted by the results. So I don't want to make light of that in any way. And I also want to acknowledge that it's not the only thing that matters. There's a lot of other things happening, a lot of other ways that we can participate. Once again, ranked choice voting, I think, is a great example. It's not partisan. It's not a party ideology. It's supported by a broad spectrum of people and it has the possibility of changing our political narrative so yep. don't don't forget that there are other ways to contribute to take care of your community to take care of yourself and and to allow yourself to decompress step back and, and breathe and and yep. as eric said go vote and after you go vote maybe play with your cat yeah it's just important because we're all on edge. If you're not on edge, I'd love to know why. So Yeah, please tell us how, me, you're, how that's happening. Let me happening. know, <laughs> because there's a lot going on. But So I, I don't know when our next show is going to be for sure. We just want to say that up front. We're going to kind of wait and see what happens and, and try to give you something um, timely and relevant. Because we are, like, it feels like the countdown to launch, except that the rocket might blow up on the pad. I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, so. I watched The Challenger when I was a kid. Yeah. And that was, like, a thing. The, the difference is, is we weren't sitting there expecting that to happen. That's why it was so shocking. So right now. That was hard. Like, we're kind of hoping. So continue hoping. And uh, we'll be back shortly. But we look forward to bringing you, hopefully, some more positive things in the near future. Thanks for listening. If you have ideas, feedback, thoughts, suggestions on how to decompress and feel good, as Eric suggested, please find us on social media. We are by Kyrian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can give us a call at 303-578-9155, or you can email us at podcast at bycurian.com. And if you like what we're doing, please rate us on your listening platform of choice. Thank you.